Hello, everybody. Larry Berman here. Welcome to our webinar version of Investor's Guide to Thriving. Uh, hopefully, after this hour and a half or so, you'll get a, a really good snapshot of uh, ETFs, um, how to build some portfolios, a little bit how to think about yourself in terms of what type of investor you are uh, and how to best uh, put together portfolios that, that suit your investment style. Uh, we're going to be using polling today, uh, so there are four polls. I will uh, launch a poll. I will ask about it, and uh, for those of you uh, that are, want to participate, you can participate in our on our polling. Uh, those will just pop up on the screen for you. Um, and, but first, um, and what makes all our events across Canada um, very affordable, i.e., free for everyone, is is our sponsors. So first, we're going to hear from. Justin Corteau of BMO Wealth Management. He's going to tell us a little bit about um, how online investing solutions for the do-it-yourself crowd, followed by Kevin Prinz of BMO ETFs. And Kevin's going to talk about uh, a little bit about BMO ETFs and some of the solutions that they offer for investors. And then I will take over for the last part of the uh, presentation here today. And, um, and again, finish off with Q&A. So without uh, further, further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Justin. Thank you, Larry. So um, prior to uh, Larry and Kevin from BMO ETFs going into um, the different type of investor and the various ETF strategies and how best you can take advantage, I just wanted to take 10 minutes or so to go over some of the investing platforms uh, available to you so that you have a complete picture of what your options are. Um, when it comes to time to actually taking action on some of these recommendations. So firstly, uh, and good news for everybody on the phone, I'm sure, as we're using a webinar here, but as you can probably imagine, more and more Canadians are choosing to do a lot of their investing online uh, rather than in person at a branch. And as a result of this, uh, the banks have adapted. And so now it's not just a matter of either choosing you know, a broker or a mutual fund at the branch or a self-directed side where it's at all do it yourself um, and you live and die by that sword. There's actually a, been a lot of improvements and advancements in the um, online platform space, um, giving you the investor a lot more options in terms of how you're going to execute uh, your strategy and how you're going to uh, develop your uh, strategy and your research plan. So basically right now at BMO, we have three different um, groups of online investors. Um, the first one um, is the kind of investor, and this may be many of you on the phone, who wants um, all the research tools available, um, likes to do um, all their own research, likes to decide how much of a stock or bond or ETF or mutual fund they hold and when to sell. So the first person, which many of you may already be in terms of the self-directed, is someone who wants complete control over their investments. The second one is uh, the type of investor who wants complete control of their investors, but doesn't mind having a bit of a backup there to review the portfolio to make sure things are going well, uh, to make sure that the investment choices being made are in line with the amount of risk one wants to take. And then the third uh, group is people that typically uh, do not want a lot of control over their investments. They're much happier um, giving over that control to a professional manager and allowing them to be able to make those decisions for them um, and really only checking in from time to time to make sure that things are going in the right direction. So at Investor Line, we have what we call the pilot, co-pilot, and autopilot platform there. Uh, Larry, if you can go forward. Oh, back up just a little bit there. Oh, yeah, right there. Perfect. So, yeah, so the self-directed advice direct and smartfolio platform. So I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on each, just going over um, the type of investor that would use each one, as well as what the benefits of you. So many of you are already very, very familiar with self-directed. Um, at BMO, we have our investor line site. Some of you may be using it already. Some of you might be using another one at another uh, uh, but again, as I said earlier, this is for the person who wants full control of their investment decisions. They want low, low fees, um, basically just the trading fee on there. And they decide how simple or how sophisticated they're going to be. So it may just be logging on to buy, you know, the pot stock of the week, whatever it may be. Or it may be um, that you do an awful lot of research. You're a day trader. You're watching charts, analysis, everything. It's really up to you to decide how um, 
how, how involved you want to be. Um, one of the things that might be very valuable to those on the phone today is our ETF screener and compare tool. Uh, that's where you can go in and you can basically use a giant filter to process all the ETFs that are available in the market today and decide what meets your uh, criteria. So maybe you're looking for a specific dividend yield. Maybe you're looking for a specific MER. Maybe you're looking for a specific um, yield. Whatever the case may be, um, you can use that filter um, to narrow down your choices. Uh, the other thing with the investor line um, application is we have these amazing apps that are actually uh, award-winning apps and they really do a great job as you can see on the screen there of showing you in great detail all the information about your account in terms of your asset allocation your cash details getting portfolio quotes whether you're up or down in each individual stock very very user friendly very very easy to use and obviously good on your phone or ipad on there so we've spent a lot of time on this to really make sure it's simple, easy, and gives you all the information you would want to know. So again, I won't go too much into this self-directed because as I said, many of you likely already have a self-directed um, account already at home, either with Bank of Montreal or elsewhere, and you are very familiar with how that works. The second platform is our Advice Direct platform. Now this you may not be familiar, even those with Bank of Montreal currently may not be very familiar. The Advice Direct platform is just like self-directed in that it gives you complete control over your investments. So you still decide what you're going to buy, how much you're going to buy, and later on when you're going to sell. But the difference with Advice Direct is it actually gives you advice as to what you should be buying based on the amount of risk you want to take, how long you should be holding it, and then later on, it'll actually send you a notification of when you're going to sell. Um, and it's based on the fundamentals of the company. So a very, very solid winning strategy for that buy hold client. And this is typically who the advice direct client is. Okay. So if you can just skip to the next slide for me, Larry, please. So basically very, very simplistic how it works. Many of you have seen this before. Um, you have different profiles, whether it be very, very conservative and the income profile all the way to aggressive growth. And that will determine the kind of recommendations you start to get. From there, it monitors four things uh, all 24 hours a day. It manages your asset allocation. So if you are a balanced profile and you're 53% equity, it's gonna make sure you stay within about 10% of that, not deviating too much, because after all, asset allocation, for those that know, is a huge factor in determining your success or failure as an investor. More important than any one stock is your asset allocation. So it's gonna monitor that for you, so you don't have to. It's going to make sure that your risk is in line with, in this case, a balanced profile and that you're not taking excessive risk in small cap stocks or something that really is far too volatile for the kind of risk you're wanting to take. It's going to make sure you're diversified. It's going to make sure that even if you are very familiar with one sector, that you are really branching out and getting involved in tech, in oil and gas, in mining, in everything there to make sure that you have the best um, and the, the best sectors, every sector, uh, giving you a very balanced and very diversified portfolio. And then finally, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, the ratings. Our research is looking at about 7,000 companies right now all across North America. And we use a company called Market Grader to do that. We use Morningstar for our mutual funds. And it's making sure that at any given time, you are holding companies that are the strongest in their given marketplace. Okay, so if you could just flip the slide for me there, all right, all right to the next one. Okay, so here's a sample research report for uh, some unknown company. So among the 7,000 companies, everyone gets a buy, hold, or sell rating. Buy is good, you get a green on there, and they get a rating between one and 100. Obviously, the higher the number, the stronger the company. So in this case, if you look at that wheel, it's measuring four factors, the growth of the company. In other words, how is it growing over the last three years, five years, in terms of its market share? Okay, how are its earnings? Okay, how is its EPS growth? Profitability. Okay. It's looking at its cash flow and fundamental, uh, or fundamental to the, to the strategy is value. Does it make sense to be buying this stock at a given point? And later on, when is it a good time to sell when it's overpriced? So as you can see, there's about 24, give or take, equations or ratios there that it's looking at at any given time to make sure that when you are building your portfolio, you are building it with solid, solid companies that are in position to grow their stock price, that are growing market share in the environment and the sector that they're in, and that you are not overpaying for those companies. Okay? 
So that's advice direct. So again, it's giving you, think of it as self-directed. It's still giving you the control to make the investment choices. Still giving the control to make those investment choices, but it's giving you some backup, some research to be able to back up those, that research for you. And the last one is the smart folio. So the smart folio, going back earlier to what I said, is more for that investor who wants to relinquish a bit of control, has maybe worked with self-directed in the past a lot and really just doesn't have the time anymore to be going into the research and to be um, keeping up with the research reports or anything. So again, much like a mutual fund, you have uh, different model portfolios there, anywhere from the capital preservation model all the way up to equity growth there. And what it's building is an entire portfolio of ETFs, BMO ETFs, in fact, okay, for you to manage. And so it's basically being managed by global asset management, uh, BMO Nesbitt Burns here. So it's not simply a robot doing everything, it's actually managed by people and being able to take advantage of different sectors, um, different stages in the uh, economy, and really tailoring the ETF portfolio by time and by your risk tolerance. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up again, uh, the three versions available. Now again, this is because of the increased presence of online investors, we've been able to develop more platforms than just your um, typical self-directed, which is your pilot. You have your co-pilot, which is the advice direct platform. If you're wanting to take a little bit of the research off your plate and get a little bit of backup, get a little bit of a co-pilot there to make sure that you're headed in the right direction, that you're picking stocks that work for you, that you're not taking excessive amounts of risk and that your asset allocation makes sense for you. Okay, so a co-pilot, taking some of the research off, but giving you complete control still of your investments. And then finally, Smartfolio. Again, for those clients that may be want to relinquish a little bit of that control, want to leave it in the hands of uh, professional portfolio managers, but are not interested in paying the fee that comes with high price mutual funds or the like. So this is an option for you. Uh, again, it's completely online, available and accessible to you, um, but you would not be picking the ETFs that go in there. That would be done by professional money managers in there. Okay. So just a quick glimpse of sort of all of the pros and cons on each of the one, but really, it, for each one of the platforms, you have a number of options there uh, if you're wanting to open an account. The first one is they're all available online, of course. So you can click, go to bmo.com um, slash investor line and you can go to anyone and open an application on your own. The other option, if you're not sure or have more questions, because obviously this was very brief, is to go speak with a financial planner in whatever branch is closest to you. And they can give you a lot more detail on all the three platforms. And they would really look at you uh, and you'd have a conversation to figure out what was probably the best suited for you based on you know, the, your experience, how much time you have, um, and what really be um, uh, best for you. So with that, I will pass it over to uh, Kevin. Okay, thank you very much, Justin. Uh, now we'll have Kevin Prins from BMO ETFs uh, give us a, a little overview of BMO ETFs um, and why ETFs make the most sense uh, compared to selecting individual securities. Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Larry, and uh, thanks for everyone taking the time to join in uh, the conversation today. And that's really what I want to do is spend some time in education. So first thing I want to highlight right off the bat is this slide we put up on the screen here around asset allocation. And I know the industry certainly likes to talk about picks this and buy that. Now, the one key thing that really it's in all our textbooks in our industry and uh, been brought up more and more time to time is asset allocation and the absolute importance of asset allocation. And what you're seeing on your screen here is a study done back many years ago, back in 81 and then 86, uh, 96 refer reaffirmed. It's really talking about asset allocation being 91% of the volatility in your portfolio. So that's the up and down movement. So getting your asset mix right helps mitigate volatility in your portfolio. And it lines up to what you're personally looking for. The other aspect that I want to highlight here too is there's a further study done by Ibbotson and what they looked at and they said, well, you know what? It doesn't just mean volatility or asset allocation. It means your performance. And what Ibbotson found in their stats is that 100% of your performance comes from your asset allocation. So two key things when you're thinking about asset allocation, think about it as in your volatility, your risk, but also thinking about it as your overall performance. 
Now, Larry, if you can skip to the next slide, because what I want to be clear about here is when I'm talking about asset allocation, oh, yeah, when I want to talk about asset allocation, I am not talking about a static set it and forget it approach, because that asset mix can change over time, and that is part of your uh, part of your performance. But what I'm really talking about is security selection not being as big as much of an aspect. The, the perform the the selection of different sectors, asset classes, geographies for that matter, really lead to the key part of your portfolio. So what am I showing you on the screen here? I'm actually showing you over the last number of years, and bear with me when we do the live presentations, a lot of people want a copy of the presentation. Certainly just ask for it at the end of the session, you can get a copy of this. This is a slide I see a lot of people asking for. But what I'm really highlighting here is that over time, different parts of the market, whether it's equities or fixed income, for that matter, in addition to that, whether it be uh, international or European, you'll have different performances. And a great example in 2016, Canada led the marketplace. But if you held that portfolio from 2015, it was the bottom part of the portfolio. So shifting and rotating around asset classes is a strategy that adds value on a regular basis. The good thing is now is that ETS went into this space and we offer all of these exposures for you to get access to them. So you can actually start to do this yourself and rotate to the marketplace based upon your feelings or your belief on what the market is offering you for opportunity set going forward and rotate through that across the board. So it's not set and forget anymore. It really is taking a dynamic approach to it. One thing I do want to highlight here, though, is you see in the gray line, you're seeing those balanced portfolios. See, that's kind of a mixed portfolio solution set. You can say, well, it does just kind of core in the middle across the board. Now, Larry, can you skip to the next slide? Because when we're talking about set and forget it, if you're looking for something in the marketplace that kind of does this for you, because you can certainly use ETFs to do it for yourselves, and there's a lot of choices in ETFs. We're very proud to be one of the the dominant providers out there in the marketplace. But if you're looking for somebody to do it for you, or maybe have a core of your portfolio run for you, I will quickly highlight there is a uh, ET, there's a mutual fund available in the marketplace, available in the bank, well, in a, 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 through advisors, bank branches, well, it's also available in, in a D-class format through any discount brokerage out there. And it's actually run by uh, Larry Berman. And what he does is he takes that same thought process of maybe I want to rotate through the marketplace, not picking individual stocks, but picking ETFs and deciding which ETF to rotate into and rotate out. Yes, of course, he uses BMO ETFs. But in addition, where he feels there's a market exposure that we don't offer, he can use any third-party ETF on the overall marketplace. What I want to highlight briefly about this one is, and give full credit to Larry, he won an A-plus award this year in 2017, for 2017. What does that really mean? That means the top 5% of portfolio managers in the marketplace. So Larry brought out a strategy, and I've known him for many years, about rotating the market through ETFs. We're very pleased to take that concept and bring it into a mutual fund format. And one more thing on it quickly is that it really is a strategy where he takes the market and brings up the risk or down the risk. He's trying to sleep at night for the most part. But if there is opportunity sets in the marketplace, he can dial up the risk or take it down. Generally, it's lower, lower risk because that's his focus, sleep at night. But if there is an opportunity set, maybe in a certain sector or certain asset class, he can dial that up too. So it really is rotating through the marketplace. So if you're looking for that, that is available at D-Class across the board. We have a balance mandate. We have a growth approach, and we have a dividend-focused approach. The stats you're seeing here are on the dividend fund, which is a five-star fund available on this thing. And I just encourage you to go to your respective uh, brokerage firm you're working with, type in the uh, tactical dividend fund, take a look at that for metrics. And then shifting gears here, talking a little bit about BMO ETFs. We've been very pleased, and thank you for all of your participation with Insider BMO ETFs, and if you have them for your own consideration. Here's a little stat going on the overall marketplace. We have been the dominant player for the last uh, seven years in a row. Not just in Canada and perspective-wise, I'm very pleased to say that BMO ETFs is actually start to make a format on the global marketplace, as we have an arm in the UK and the arm in the Hong Kong now, and so that's made us a top 10 provider in fixed income ETFs out there. Plus also in the, uh, the dominant provider and uh, smart bait ETFs become more and more popular out there. What I am showing you the bar charts down below is what's going on in the overall ETF industry. I'd like to highlight the overall ETF industry is around about $150 million, billion dollars now in uh, ETFs in Canada. So definitely a growing market and a lot of net new providers, around 28 different providers in the overall marketplace here in Canada. So lots of opportunities, lots of selection out there. Maybe we can skip to the next slide there, Larry. 
if you're trying to get some in, insight on research in the marketplace, one thing we have built out for advisors and portfolio managers is kind of a more advanced website. We have our core website. If you've been to it, it's our bmoetails.com uh, website, uh, www.bmoetails.com. That's probably the core information on our ETFs. If you want more of an advanced look at ETFs, I can highlight our www.bmoetfs.ca really designed for more advisors, portfolio managers, and for those people who have a, some knowledge going into buying the ETFs and want to dive a little bit deeper, I'll encourage that. And let's get to the next support slide we have for you there. The other thing you can do, if you're looking to do a comparison on any ETF in Canada versus another ETF in Canada, both on our dashboard, I just mentioned, the www.bmoetfs.ca or www.bmoetfs.com, in both cases you get access to ETF tools, Right on the ETF tools is the comparison uh, comparison charts. You can bring in any ETF, and actually you can do three side-by-side -side comparisons to do any analytics on any ETF in Canada. So with all the choices out in the marketplace, it always does help to dig, in, dig underneath the hood and take a little look there to see what are you getting, what are the exposures. And you can even dive into complete detail here through this tool. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Last but not least, I'll just quickly highlight um, you know, if you're looking at uh, support and information out there, we do put some materials together. You can access them on our website on on list of ETFs out there, as well as some information on the BMO ETFs. I won't spend too much time on this because I want to hand it over to Larry right now and let him take it away. Larry? All right. Thanks very much, Kev. And uh, hopefully now for the next hour or so, I'll go through my presentation. Uh, leaving some time for questions at the end. I know many of you have already started to write in some questions. I'm certainly not going to be able to get to all of them, but I, I will try to get to as many as I possibly can. So today's agenda for me, I want to talk about the different types of investor personalities. Uh, if you recall last series uh, webinars, we went into great detail on investor personality types. Um, there is a link available to uh, to see uh, the webinar uh, on there if you want to go and look at for some more details. So I'm going to cover it at a high level. I really want to spend a lot of time on the tools, understanding uh, the ETFs and the different types of asset classes they cover, uh, looking at some economic scenarios, and then designing some portfolios for uh, the different investor types that, to suit some of these uh, uh, economic scenarios and, and then Q&A. I'll start off by saying I'm a value investor at my core. A lot of people, you know, ask me about you know, marijuana stocks and, you know, the fast moving stuff of the day and what's going on with them. And that's not the type of investor I am. I am a value investor at my core. I look to position more strategically for longer term into areas there that have what's called intrinsic value. So one of the best value investors of, of our uh, generation of the past hundred years uh, has been Benjamin Graham. Uh, Graham and Dodd wrote a book in 1934 uh, called Securities Analysis, and that was the one of the founding documents of value investing in the world. Warren Buffett was a student um, of Graham in university, and so just to give you uh, some insight there, very famous quote in the book by Graham said, investor's chief problem, even his worst enemy, is likely to be himself. What he was referring to there is the uh, emotional challenge that we have uh, switching between cognitive and, and emotional decision making. Uh, so all of us have, have elements of this. Uh, we have two parts of our brain. Um, basically, we have our frontal lobe, which is really developed over the last couple thousand years of, of mankind, or should I say people kind, um, where the emotional side goes back to the days of the caveman, where all you had to do uh, during the day is, is stay alive, fight off your enemy and, and hunt for food. And we really didn't give a lot of thought to Sudoku problems or what securities to buy for that matter. Uh, so the default part of our brain is the emotional part. It's been with us the longest. Uh, there's a lot of things that we believe we're making cognitive choices are, um, but, but are really emotionally driven. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research being done in this area. Uh, one of the uh, main reasons I got involved with the uh, 
uh, Baycrest Hospital here in Toronto was because of their uh, research into brain health. Uh, obviously, when you can't make a, uh, a great informed decision cognitively, um, it's, it's a challenge for people. I did a very interesting study a number of years ago where they put me in an MRI machine, hooked up my brain to all the wires and put me in the machine and they could actually see what's going on in my brain and which part of my brain is, is operating, uh, so to speak, as they ask questions. So as they're, I'm answering questions by tapping on buttons in the MRI machine, uh, they can see, you know, where's that decision coming from? Is it from the, uh, the core frontal the lobe of the brain, the, the cortex, where our cognitive decision-making comes from, or is it from the emotional part of the brain or the amygdala, which releases hormones and drives a lot of that, um, what, and we know in market terms as fight and flight mechanism. So in the last 10 years, they've, they've tested traders uh, in this capacity. Uh, and so you can imagine being in one of these machines with live trading going on, your P&L going up and down, up and down as you're making trades, and they could see what your brain is doing. And so what they've learned from this is what the, when you're winning money um, uh, in your investment account, you, you get a release of dopamine. And literally and chemically, you're, you're getting high. It's actually no different than taking a hit of crack cocaine. It's the same chemical response in your brain. When you're losing money, you get a release of adrenaline. Your heartbeat starts going faster. And it's no different than if someone held a gun to your head and said, give me your money, or a wild animal was chasing you. Uh, you get a release of adrenaline, the fight and flight mechanism kicks in, and it forces you to do something. So in our world, this is primarily what drives most of our trading decisions. It's either the uh, fear of missing out sometimes, uh, or it's the panic of, of stopping the loss out uh, so that we stop the bleeding and, and that uncomfortable feeling we get uh, when markets are going against uh, what we believe uh, to be true. So the vast majority of investment decisions are, are emotionally driven. Um, you know, so it doesn't matter what type of investor you are, whether you're the passive, uh, the independent, the accumulator, or the preserver. Uh, everybody suffers from this emotional uh, impact with their investment decisions. There's a firm in the U.S. called Dalbar, based in Massachusetts, uh, D-A-L-B-A-R. You can go do a Google search on that name and, and come across some of their their papers and works and effectively what they've been doing for the last couple decades is they, they look at buy and hold returns. Uh, so on the right side of the graphic here, you're seeing the S&P 500 had a 10.16% 10 10 return uh, if you bought and held it for the last 30 years by way of a low cost ETF. And today that's available in any number of ways, very, very low cost. So call it, you know, 10.11. Uh, but basically a very good return. They've taken the Investment Fund Institute data, um, which is all the buying and selling tickets that go into mutual funds, and for the last decade or so, they've included ETFs in that. And so they've calculated what's known in the industry as a money-weighted return, or the, the actual real return you get when you factor in all the money flow going in and out um, of your portfolios, you know, going to cash, going back in the market, going to cash, going back in the market, and so forth. Uh, and that the realized uh, return of uh, equity fund investors is much closer to 4%. Um, and so what they, they say is, well, there's definitely uh, cost to investing, uh, without a doubt, um, MERs and transaction costs and, and whatnot. Um, the vast majority of cost in investing is the emotional cost uh, that's pushing us in and out of, of the market um, for various reasons. Again, fear of missing out, uh, the latest and greatest stock, something that's very oversold, trying to catch a falling knife or a bottom, uh, stopping out of our portfolio because there's some market anxiety. You know, we, we go through a period of market anxiety pretty much twice a year as, as regular clockwork. Um, I've got some charts to show you on uh, volatility of markets. So let me get into the investor types here, and I'll give you some high-level uh, ideas on what some of these emotional challenges that uh, uh, each type uh, tends to have. So the preserver, for example, if you were going to go to uh, the, the, B, the BMO autopilot where they build portfolios for you, um, 
you know they'll they'll answer you ask you a bunch of questions about your risk and return uh, needs for your portfolio um, and what will come out if you're the preserver type is that wealth preservation is far more important than growth in your portfolio and you'll ultimately end up with a, a style of investing that is going to be a lot more fixed income oriented than it is for growth because in the long run fixed income is less risk um, one of the challenges of course today is that bond yields of the world are so very very low that the average person uh, who says wealth preservation over growth is uh, is maybe not going to get the uh, outcome they would have otherwise uh, like you tend to be very loss averse uh, and generally so you know you, you you have a worse experience because you can't uh, afford to take the risk I, I've often said the biggest cost of investing is your ability to handle the ride it's not it's not the ETF issuer, it's not the stock you buy, it's none of those things whatsoever. It's your own personal ability to handle the standard deviation of return. Standard deviation is a statistical measurement of the value of your portfolio going up and down every day. So for those of you who go online and look at the value every day and when it's red uh, from the previous day you go oh, darn and you don't feel good about it when and when it's green you're feeling good about it listen that's emotion it's nothing to do with cognitive thoughtful building of a diversified portfolio where you just stick it and leave it and I very often said the vast majority of people I mean the vast vast majority of people should have a hundred percent equities and never trade just buy that long-term portfolio where equities in the long run is going to give you the best source of return. Unfortunately, it also gives you some of the highest volatility of return. And so, again, the biggest cost of investing is not the MER. Uh, it's actually the uh, ability to handle the ride, and that's so important. Uh, so the preserver tends to uh, have very, very emotional decisions because they, uh, they are loss averse and they're basically status quo, meaning uh, they're not able to, to make changes in, in a uh, really uh, productive way. Uh, the follower type of investor, now in the follower, you, you really need a co-pilot. You need someone to help you build a portfolio in general because you tend to be very passive. You tend to have a lack of interest uh, you you tend to desire direction when making decisions because you don't have the confidence uh, needed. So um, you, there's a do-it-yourself environment for you too uh, that keeps costs down versus p potentially dealing with uh, uh, sort of a, the full service uh, kind of approach. Um, you tend to have a low risk tolerance as well. Um, your impactful biases uh, tend to be framing and recency. Framing means you're easily misled. For example, I could put up in front of you a slide of two ETFs and I could force you to choose one over the other just because I'm showing you it's got a lower MER um, and not really tell you what's, what's behind that. The fact that tracking error might be higher. A lot of other factors that are going to give you a worse return, but I'll sell you what you want to buy because you're looking for a cheaper solution. Um, and obviously, the lowest cost solution is not necessarily the best one. You also suffer from recency bias, uh, which tends to mean you have lack of discipline. You, you miss out on the big picture. So you tend to want to buy what's moving and, and fast rather than considering a well-diversified global portfolio. Um, and that's just because of the general lack of knowledge in terms of how to build portfolios. Again, hopefully after this, you'll get some insight into at least how to think about structuring them from a big uh, picture perspective to minimize the cognitive and emotional um, mistakes that we all tend to make, me or anyone else. Uh, I've been studying this stuff for the better part of 20 years, and I would say I'm, I'm probably one of the leading experts uh, in Canada, if not in, in North America, um, as a subject matter expert in, in behavioral finance as it relates to investing and investment decisions. Um, and I still suffer from some of these things. because Why? Because they're emotional. And so the goal is, is minimizing the emotional impact uh, that we have on our event investing. The independent, which I suspect is most of the audience uh, here, is, tends to be very engaged in the investment process. Again, you want to put in your ticket. You, you want some access to some research to do some work. 
Um, and so again, you know, BMO uh, uh, online has some some solutions for you in the uh, in the autopilot uh, world. Um, the investing style tends to be very active, and your risk tolerance tends to be a bit above above average, although not you wouldn't necessarily call yourself an aggressive investor. You tend to suffer from confirmation bias, and that's effectively uh, you've got a position on, maybe, maybe you heard someone on BNN or CNBC say they like a stock or an ETF, and you kind of go out and buy it. Um, generally, what you're looking for is when you call into Berman's call, you know, say, Larry, I bought this ETF at $25. It's it's currently at 20. What should I do? Should I buy more? Uh, you're you're effectively looking for me to tell you it's okay, uh, and you're you're looking for confirmation. Uh, but if I were to say, you know what, I really don't like the energy sector here. I think it's going to go down 10 or 15 percent. You would ignore me. You would say, yeah, he's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about um, because you you're really looking for confirmation. Um, in in terms of uh, the next show that comes on after Berman's call is commodities. And let's say Andy Bell has a guest on who's talking about energy and you've got that position on and all of a sudden they tell you why oil is going to go to uh, $100 a barrel and supplies are very, very tight. And then you turn up the volume because that confirms your, your belief. Um, because you you have this confirmation bias, again, you tend not to... Um, do a lot of research. Uh, you tend not to have very diversified portfolios. And again, with ETFs, makes the investment, uh, uh, the, the most important part of building investment portfolios. Going back to the very first slide that Kevin showed, talking about what are the major sources of returns when it comes to investing and defining your bottom line, bottom line, bottom line. Uh, is that asset allocation. It's not the securities you pick. It's not market timing. So keep that in mind. And finally, the accumulator, uh, which is basically a more aggressive investor, very, very active. Typically, this type of person has been very, very successful in their business uh, life. Um, they tend to be uh, suffer from overconfidence and the illusion of control, uh, and that is you're so confident in what you do, uh, everyone else is wrong and you're right, um, and you tend to, again, build very concentrated portfolios because you, you have a lot of confidence in your investment decisions, and there's nothing wrong with having confidence in your investment decisions as long as you keep with the principles of making sure you're diversified. I can tell you by someone who specialized in the investment world for 30 years, I have no idea which stocks are going to outperform over the next 6 to 12 months. If you really asked everybody off the record to tell you what they really, really believed at their core essence, do you believe that you can out beat the market? There, In some asset classes, the answers are going to be yes, but the vast majority of portfolio managers who do this professionally do not beat the buy and hold index. It, the, the facts are overwhelming. Uh, all the talk you hear from people that we're going to a stock picker's market and all that kind of stuff uh, is all about that person trying to defend their turf because what do they do? They pick stocks. Now, you might say the same of me. Larry, you manage ETF portfolios. You're just talking about your turf. Uh, correct, I am, but I have the science and the academic research behind what I'm saying is that asset allocation is the secret, not security selection, not market timing um, in terms of the bottom line, bottom line of your portfolio. Caveat at the bottom being if you can handle the ride. So it's, it's essential that when you're building portfolios for yourself, um, you understand what the ride's going to look like. And I'll, I'll come back to that theme a couple times throughout the presentation. If you want to find out more about um, investor types, a gentleman by the name of Michael Pompian uh, created, uh, wrote a book uh, in 2012, um, and this is where I got a lot of this information. I didn't make up any of these uh, uh, titles or names or anything. Uh, these are broadly covered. Uh, this book was written, uh, Pompian is a finan U.S. financial advisor, and it's written uh, for financial advisors. So it's it's a very, very uh, uh, interesting book, but it's written for financial advisors to help them uh, deal with and build portfolios um, 
for for their clients. Uh, but I think you'll get some out of it. So another book recommendation, very simply, if people don't understand ETFs, many times coming out to our events, a handful of people come up to me and say, Larry, really enjoyed the stuff. I'm new to this. Um, you know, can I learn more about basics of ETFs? Uh, there's no more basic book than um, ETFs for dummies. And don't don't be fooled by the, the title. It's very, very simple understanding of what ETFs are all about. Um, so that, that would be helpful for, for everybody who wants to learn more. Uh, getting into the ETF toolbox, um, I talked a little bit about um, equities being the longest, uh, long-term best source of return. And um, it's, it's a very important uh, truth. In the long run, equities tend to deliver, depending on what country you're in, where you are in the world, but the very long run return is in the neighborhood of 10% a year. Put up your hand, who wants 10% a year you know, in your portfolio? And the answer is going to be pretty much everybody. Um, when you measure from a bear market bottom to a peak, the average return tends to be in the mid-teens, but you, when you measure from a, uh, a peak to a trough, the average returns tend to be negative. So the mean is 10, but the ride is your ability to handle the volatility of returns. And so the long-run annualized standard deviation for equities, uh, North American, is in the 15 to 18% range. Um, and what you can expect in a papa bear market, in a big bear market, uh, is a decline of two to three standard deviations historically. And so that's going to mean somewhere between 30 and 50%. The average Papa Bear, I got a chart, chart to show you in a few minutes, uh, measures 34%. And when you look at what causes those Papa Bears, they're typically in and around financial systemic risk and recessions. So in the next recession that hits North America, I think we're, we're likely to see one in late 2019 or 2020, you can bet that equities are, are going to fall in, in that 30 to 50% range. And it's going to depend on lots of factors that no one's really going to know for sure um, how deep it's going to get. No one can tell you that. You can't look at a chart and say this is where it's going. Anybody who, who propagates that stuff and tells you they know where things are going, run as far as you can from them because they're really they're either shills or hucksters or they're trying to uh, um, to sell you something basically. The narrower your your focus in your portfolio, the less diversified you are, fewer sectors. The potential for return increases because if you're right, you can obviously make a lot more money. Um, but you, it's at the expense of higher standard deviation of returns in your portfolio. If you're okay with that, if you're a high risk seeking investor and, and not subject to the emotional roller coaster, which most people are not, uh, then it's fine to run high conviction concentrated portfolios. But rest assured, you are going to have a more volatile ride. It's that simple. Okay, um, the more uh, or the, the lower correlated sectors you have or asset classes in your portfolio are going to smooth out your ride. Okay, um, so let me get into some of the very basic types of ETFs and drill down to, some, to finish off with the active type. Um, you can build portfolios very, very simple. I should say these aren't recommendations on this list here. Uh, if you're taking pictures of it or writing things down, by all means, go ahead. Um, but these are not recommendations. Um, recommendations will come at the end where I looked at some, some ETFs and, and how to construct some basic portfolios from them. Um, XIC is the broad TSX index. SPY is biggest ETF in the world. The S&P 500. EFA is the developed market outside North America known as EFI, Europe, Australasia, Far East and emerging markets, EEM. Those four ETFs probably make up about 85% of the world equity market. Or very simply, you can buy the Vanguard Total World ETF, trades in New York for 18 basis points, and it has just about every stock in the world in it, large, mid, small cap, all country, all world, uh, including emerging markets. So it could be that simple as having one ETF in your portfolio that represents equities, and you can have a couple ETFs that represent bonds, which I'll talk about in a minute, and it could be that simple. And then it becomes your asset allocation call. How much fixed income do you want? How much equity do you want in your portfolio? And what should that balance be? Uh, I do believe because bond yields are very, very low, 
and equity valuations are, are very, very high relative to long-term standards, um, that the returns on both asset classes over the next decade plus are going to be significantly lower than they have been. Um, you can get into building portfolios through sector exposures to make up your market. So, for example, XIC, uh, XEG would be part of that. ZEB would be the bank part of that. Uh, VRE would be the REIT part of that and so forth. You could build your uh, sector-based uh, exposures and therefore, rather than just buying the market in a simple way like the TSX, you could overweight energy or underweight energy or overweight the banks or underweight the banks relative to the broad index and then through asset allocation try to deliver either higher dividends or better better we'll call risk-adjusted returns, i.e. the return adjusted for the volatility you need to assume to to get there. Uh, Kevin mentioned in my sleep at night portfolio global dividend strategy that I talk about on BNN quite often. Last year we won an A plus award. Uh, so the uh, fund data, which is the um, organization that uh, tracks all the mutual fund data in Canada, uh, look has a certain formula where they look at uh, what is the best return of that asset class. Uh, relative to the risk you take to get that. And, and so our A-plus portfolio delivered that uh, last year. So very happy about that. You can get into niche sectors like marijuana, like blockchain, like lithium. Uh, so the whole battery uh, uh, electrification of the economy, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence. They're all a bit more speculative because they're very, very early stage uh, investments, so expect a lot more volatility. Um, but again, I would rather play the entire sector theme uh, than trying to fi figure out which one or two or three companies might be the winner. Uh, if you remember back in the tech boom in the late 90s and early 2000s, 98% of those companies that listed IPOs in the late 1990s don't exist anymore. Uh, went out of business. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about new themes and new new ways to play. Uh, everybody who's a capitalist, you know, is going to hang a shingle out saying we do something with blockchain. Uh, there was a Long Island iced tea company that literally sells iced tea that added, and we do blockchain. And the stock took off, uh, you know, after that. It reminds me exactly about the dot-com boom where um, a company that sold pet food all of a sudden said pet.com and, and took off uh, in a big, big way as well because they were a dot-com. So be mindful of this speculative phase when it happens. Sometimes these phases can last years and years. So for, for those of you who are aggressive type investors, by all means, you know, you can speculate in them, but uh, just keep in mind that you're speculating, not investing. Uh, and then there's the smart indexing strategy, the smart beta they're called, uh, or smart indexing. And what I really like about these is um, rather than buying the MSCI World Index, uh, for example, and getting uh, the ACWI, the, the whole world ETF, um, which is an iShare version of the whole world that does not include uh, small cap stocks uh, like the Vanguard does uh, or emerging markets, um, you can buy the... Uh, MSCI Global Quality Index. So that's a subset of the world index. But what you're doing there is you're looking for the best quality of companies, the best balance sheets, the best cash flow, the best, uh, uh, you name it, uh, EBITDA, enterprise value, and so forth. So um, when, when you're buying an active mutual fund and that manager is picking stocks, you want them to pick the best quality companies to do the job. Well, now in an ETF, for 30 to 50 basis points, you can get that. So they're a little bit more expensive than the what I call the dumb index or the simple index um, on the broad market basis. This is a subset of the bigger indexes that find the best quality of companies. And there's all kinds of different styles. You could have a growth focus, you could have a value focus, uh, equal weight uh, size, meaning small cap companies are preferred to growth over large cap companies. Uh, momentum factor, meaning the companies with the best earnings and price momentum. Uh, low volatility, you've probably all heard of, or there's high beta or high volatility 
uh, ways to play the market too, and of course dividends. A lot of you are probably using dividend weighted ETFs. Then there's styles like uh, with a covered call or a put right strategy. Um, you know, I went to BMO a few years ago and I said, you know, I really don't like Europe. I think it's sick. I think it's ultimately going to break apart. Uh, I would like to own the best quality dividend payers in Europe um, who have the best uh, quality balance sheets. Um, and I want to do that with a covered call overlay and generate a yield of five to six and a half percent kind of thing. Can you do that? ZWE was born a few years ago, and it's been a great way to hold European dividend stocks. Um, and now there's an unhedged version if you want to buy that and get the currency exposure to the euro um, and the British pound. Um, then there's the put right strategy. So ZPW, I, I asked BMO to create that ETF, and I said, go find me the best quality of of companies split across all the economic sectors in the U.S. Except I don't want to own them. I want to write puts. 10, 15, 20% below the current market and harvest the yield from those puts and generating a yield somewhere between 5 and 6%. Um, now, obviously, when volatility is suppressed like it was in 2017, uh, the yield is, is not as high as, as we'd like to see it. But generally speaking, a strategy like that can generate an uncorrelated yield to equity market returns or very low correlated yield. And so when I'm most bearish on the U.S. market, which I'll show you a chart in a little bit here, um, I, I like to hold ZWH and ZPW. I'm getting a yield north of 5% on the U.S. market with a risk of about 30% of the S&P 500. So if we go into a 20% bear market and I'm holding those two ETFs over a year, we go down 20%. Um, with a 30% risk factor, I would expect to fall around 6%, and I'm going to get a 5 or 6% yield while, while waiting. That's a great way to hold the market in, in a bearish environment. Um, so one question had come up already and say, what can I do you know, if, if the things are overvalued? And so one of the things you can do is put together a portfolio of ETFs of, with lower risk. Uh, and again, at the end, I'll, I'll make some recommendations for people. And then there's the active type of strategy and where you're, it's not based on an index, it's based on an active manager. And that's effectively no different than a mutual fund, but a much, much lower cost. Um, and you can trade it during the day as opposed to uh, at end of day. Um, a couple years ago on Berman's call, I said there was, I expected a five to 10% market correction over, over the, uh, fall months into late summer, so August, September, October, which is typically a very weak period of the year. And um, this gentleman stopped me on an airplane as I was heading out to Calgary. And he said, Larry, I'm, I'm quite upset with you. Uh, you told me to sell my entire portfolio a few months ago on BNN, and, um, and now the market's 10% higher. What should I do? I said, well, first of all, um, I've never met you before. What do you mean I've told you to sell your portfolio. Did you call and ask me a question? He said, no, you said there was going to be a 5 to 10% correction. And so I didn't want to see a dip in my portfolio. So I sold everything. Um, and then the markets are now 10% higher. Well, a week after I said that, I believe Bernanke announced some more QE and the markets took off. And I said, didn't you catch the show a week later when I changed my mind? And <laughs> kind of jokingly, but then I sent him a chart that looks like this. And I said, you know, I challenge you to go back in history and look for a period where you don't see at least a year of drawdowns uh, of 5 to 10 percent. In fact, on average, it happens once every eight months historically. It's, it's pretty normal. Um, obviously, when you measure the big bull market, the bear markets, and you measure all of them, they average minus 34 percent. And you can see a number of the big ones that we, we highlighted there in uh, in the 70s and 80s and back into the Great Depression era uh, as well. Um, so with that in mind, you've got to understand the risk you're taking and, and what volatility means. So a 5 to 10% correction is completely normal. Expect it to happen at least once a year. Last year was, was an anomaly. We did not see a 3% market correction all year. The last time that happened was in the early 1960s, 1963, I believe, was the last time we had a year without a 3% uh, a uh, correction. Uh, so it's extremely rare a uh, year like 2015, 2017, pardon me. Um, so the, um, the degree of downside protection in, in the recent market volatility. So what I did here was I, I 
have four ETFs that uh, are different ways to track the uh, the U.S. market. ZPW, the put right strategy that I mentioned, the high dividend covered call for the U.S., the ZWH, the ZSP, which is the S&P 500 with U.S. dollar exposure, trades in Toronto, and the S&P 500 currency hedged, which trades in Toronto. And what I'm showing you here is um, is the update of what this portfolio um, or these ETFs have done since the market peak on uh, January 26th. Uh, and I updated this as of, of yesterday. Um, so when you look at what ZPW did in a very defensive environment, it's been very, very good. The red line at the bottom is the uh, Canadian dollar exchange rate uh, versus the US dollar. And uh, you're used to thinking of it probably as 75 or 80 cents. Um, so just by way of uh, comparison, 80 cents is 125 in traded terms. 133.33 is 75 cents. Uh, so at 129.55, which was yesterday's close, that's going to give you a Canadian dollar of around 77 cents, just so you're, uh, you know, you're you're on par or uh, for what we're looking at here. So as the Canadian dollar is weakening, when this red line is rising, you want more exposure to U.S. dollars. So three of these ETFs, the first three, have exposure to the U.S. dollar, and ZUE is currency head. So that's full impact of the market decline, from which peak to trough. We saw a 12% decline, so the ratio index at, at 90 uh, on the right margin uh, would be a 10% decline, uh, everything starting at 100%. Uh, you can see what ZPW has done in that environment and ZWH, uh, much less downside. Um, but when the markets uh, sold off in February, I sold my ZPH and, and, uh, and bought my uh, U.S. market exposure back with my ZSP. Uh, I actually bought ZSPU in, in US dollars because I needed to do it in US dollars, but I bought my ZSP back. So when the markets recovered, um, my ZSP actually went up percentage wise uh, more than my ZPW and my ZWH did. Uh, and then the markets sold off again in March and I went back to my defensive strategies, uh, rinse and repeat. So um, I like ZPW and ZWH, very high yield, uh, less volatility, um, but when I want all the market upside, uh, I will play ZSP uh, and get my full beta, my full 100% of the U.S. market return, uh, or I'll do it on a hedge basis if I don't want exposure to the currency. So, you know, looking at the period from middle of March to middle of April, you see the Canadian dollar went from about 131 down back down to almost 125 or about a 3% correction. And so the ETFs with exposure to the U.S. dollar fell more than uh, the one that was hedged. So the, the green line was hedged. And that's the S&P 500, and that actually was pretty stable as the market was bottoming. Um, but because the currency was falling, ZPW, ZWH, ZSP all actually went down during that period. So hedge, not hedge, that's one decision. Market exposure, market risk versus full beta uh, exposure uh, as you're bullish and markets are rallying. Very, very important learning here um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of portfolios. So. Uh, time now for a quick survey. Um, and so what is the most important uh, risk in inequities? And uh, I'll leave the poll open for about 30 seconds here. Um, and hopefully we'll get some um, uh, response from the audience here. So they're starting to come in now. Okay, so I've got 45 seconds there. I'm going to close that off. And um, so we got uh, two-thirds of the audience voting. 34% uh, said potential losses. 33% says what you buy. 14% says fear of missing out. So, so those of you who chose fear of missing out, 14% of you, uh, that's all emotional. Okay, that's not rational 
portfolio construction that's not rational building the risk isn't fear of missing out if you think that you really ought to rethink doing it on your own because that in fact is the worst reason to buy you're going to end up chasing returns more often than not and have very very poor outcomes um, as we saw in the Dalbar study you're very very emotional the uh, linked uh, what you buy and when you buy it are uh, that's that's sort of market timing um, what you buy is, is sort of asset allocation and that's very important so again most of you su suggested that was pretty good but really the biggest most important factor in equities um, in fact in any kind of investing is the potential losses so um, I think that's uh, that's pretty important there so, so moving on now, I'm going to talk about the uh, the bond market a little bit and uh, what we call the anatomy of of bonds. So the big um, big thing here that people don't understand about fixed income is you earn the yield to maturity, not the coupon. So when I, I'm going to talk a little bit about bond math, I'm going to show you some examples. The longer it takes to get your money back on the graphic on the right, the higher the price risk you have in the security. So the more interest rate fluctuations are going to move your price up and down. And therefore, the higher yield you're going to demand for that. So you want to be compensated by your yield. That's you know how much you're going to earn as a yield to maturity. Um, remember, you don't earn the coupon. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, interest rate changes and then credit spread widening or narrowing and, and what that means in portfolio. So very simple bond math here. A 3% five-year bond trading at 105 has a yield to maturity of around 2%. Primarily because the bond is going to mature at par, what we call par is 100. Um, so you're going to get $5 of your own money back over the five-year term um, left in the bond. So about a dollar a year. So the coupon payment, you're going to get a coupon payment, semi-annual probably, um, distribution, 1.5% per time. Uh, and you, So you're going to get your 3%, but every year that bond's going to fall about a dollar in value. So you're only really yielding 2%. Now, in a taxable cash account, listen up very closely here. Do not buy premium bonds because what you are doing is turning a capital loss into annual income. And that is the worst tax trade you can make. In a registered account, it does not matter because it's taxable as income once the money is deregistered. So this doesn't apply for registered accounts, be they TFSA, RSPs, Liras, etc. doesn't matter. Um, but in a taxable situation, you're going to have to pay the 3% coupon interest per year and you're going to get a capital loss. And again, that's the worst tax trade you can make. So keep that in mind and just an understanding of how bond prices work. So the longer it is to maturity, as you see in the 10-year bond um, curve here, as yields go up and down, that's your price risk. So if yields fell from 16% um, and a bond's trading at $60 with a 6% coupon, fell to 1%, the price of that bond uh, over a year would go from $60 to $150. That's the power of that interest rate movement. A three-year bond, that curve is going to be a lot flatter. You don't have the, the price movement. So that's very, very important to learn about how bonds work, and uh, etc. I'm going to talk about the different types of bonds, not, not Sean Connery and... Um, uh, and Roger Moore, but uh, bond ETFs, um, the, you can again, like equities, start with a very, very broad definition and just have a broad bond like XBB um, or AGG. So XBB is the entire Canadian bond market. And again, emphasizing these are not recommendations. These are examples. AGG being the entire U.S. bond market. Uh, BMO has a ZAG, for example, which is the entire Canadian bond market. Uh, I think it's eight or nine basis points, and it's the largest bond in Canada. Um, so there are very simple ways to get, you know, core bond exposure. Uh, you can buy just government bonds. You can buy just corporate bonds. Um, 
international. You can buy specialty bonds that are linked to inflation, for example. Uh, I really want to focus for these economic scenarios that I'm going to be talking about uh, two really different types. Um, I want to talk about floating rate notes and what those are uh, specifically and uh, convertible bonds um, and a little bit on high yield. So um, floating rate notes are, are simply a uh, a company or government uh, would otherwise have to pay a higher coupon payment and they don't want to pay a high coupon payment. So what they ended up doing is issuing a floating rate note. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, my mistake. I was I was thinking about convertible bonds. Forget forget what I just said. Floating rate notes are linked to the short term interest rate. And so if if the government or corporate view is that interest rates are going to fall, uh, they want to issue a floating rate note uh, so that as interest rates fall, their coupon payments go down proportionally with the short-term interest rate. But as interest rates rise, the coupon payments go up. So in an environment like we're in now where central banks are, are biased towards raising interest rates, uh, in particular in the U.S. and less so in Canada, um, that floating rate notes, actually the price of the bond, uh, like I was saying before, as interest rates change, price of the bond stays relatively stable because the coupon is not fixed like it is in a nominal bond. The coupon floats. And because it floats, prices tend to uh, stay a lot more stable over time um, because of that. So it, it's something that in a rising rate environment is very, very good to hold in a fixed income portfolio. Again, a lot of people don't know what they are, but in a rising rate environment, it's much better to hold a floating rate note or a uh, floating rate preferred, uh, reset preferred, in other words, um, in your portfolio that resets the higher uh, uh, bond yields um, or floating rate notes uh, or, or floating rate yields. Uh, convertible bond is what I was starting to say before, is when a company uh, doesn't want to pay a, a high coupon because they have a credit risk, what they will do is, is offer you an option in their bond. Uh, and so because of, you have an option to convert the bond into equity, uh, they're going to pay you a lower coupon. Uh, so you get a bit of lower distribution, but as the company does well and the price of the stock goes up, uh, the bond actually has an option to turn into equity. Uh, and so it links closer to the price movement of the um, uh, of the stock um, and it's very important and high yield bonds of course these are a basket of the crappiest companies out there uh, with the worst balance sheets and their high yield they have to pay a bigger coupon because they're higher credit risk and, and so in an economic downturn these are the companies that are going to be more stressed to repay their bonds uh, holders and, and therefore have, have more price risk um, so high yield bonds trade more like equity uh, then they tend to trade like fixed income. So a couple of examples here in terms of uh, bond math, and so you get an idea. I, I put together this table. So I'm looking at two-year government bonds. It doesn't matter whether they're government bonds or in Canada or U.S. Uh, the U.S. is 50% of the world, uh, so the U.S. to me is, is what I always focus on. Um, but again, it would be no different if we were looking at government of Canada bonds. So UST stands for U.S. Treasuries, 2, 5, 10, and 30 year. And what I did here was I, I put an interest rate risk where interest rates over a year would rise 100 basis points. And I'm showing you the, the current yield uh, as of about a month or two ago. And then the shock yield or the higher yield uh, as interest rates go up. Uh, showing you the price risk of the bond uh, over the different durations. Uh, and then the total return. So focusing in on the 30-year bond, for example, um, if interest rates go up 100 basis points in long bonds, you're going to lose 17 uh, and a quarter percent price, and you're going to earn that that yield to maturity. So the total return is going to be around 13 and a half, 13.62 over over the year uh, loss. Now, if interest rates fell, so if interest rates from, went from 4.13 to 3.13, uh, which they'll typically do in a, in a market down, equity market downturn, money goes into fixed income, uh, typically, you're going to earn the 17% plus the, the, the yield. Okay, so you're going to earn, you know, t north of 20% uh, in a long bond uh, if interest rates fall 100 basis points. So 
keep that in mind. Now, so if interest rates are rising, you want shorter term rates, you have less price risk in the shorter term rates. Um, floating rate notes, I gave you the example there, you can see a one year floating rate note um, and the total return over a year uh, as rates, even as rates rise is going to be uh, pretty much close to your yield to uh, maturity there. And even the longer term horizon, you have a much, much better uh, outcome in your uh, portfolio with floating rate notes uh, as the coupons adjust in price. So very, very important learning to, to know what to use in fixed income portfolios. Uh, but again, you can just buy the whole market if you want. Uh, but with buying the whole market, you tend to have a, some interest rate risk. Uh, looking at the corporate bonds. So here we're looking at spreads widening. Um, it could be yields overall rising, but the, the corporate spread is uh, widening. So I looked at high quality bonds, which are rated typically double B and higher. Um, so an A minus bond, 5, 10 and 30 year same company, uh, interest rates going up, spread widening 100 basis points. Again, the longer it takes to get your money back, the more price risk you have as interest rate spreads move. So as the credit quality decays, the longer term bond, the more price risk you have. In the high yield space, um, you still have price risk, but because the coupon is so much higher, again, typically when when spreads widen for the high yield company, they're, they're going to widen wider. You're going to have more potential price loss. So for example, a low quality 10 year high yield bond is going to have the same price risk um, as a 30-year government bond or a 30-year high-quality corporate bond. You can see that both around 14%. So keep that in mind. The spread risk, the credit risk is also very, very Im important in, uh, in fixed income markets. So just to give you a sampling and a look at um, what uh, equities have done relative to the different types of bonds you could be investing in, um, uh, from the Trump election in November 2016 to uh, yesterday, uh, the red line is the S&P 500 return, the blue line is convertible bonds. And you can see, as I mentioned, uh, convertible bonds trade much more like equities than they do like fixed income. Although there's, they, they are technically fixed income, they track equity markets uh, more significantly. The high yield bonds, again, trade more equity-like. Uh, and so the, these are total return indices that we're looking at, uh, not just the price returns. Uh, so the high quality corporates give you a lesser return and the broad bond market, which is the green, the AGGs of the entire bond market actually, as equities were rallying, did, did very, very little for you in your portfolio. So bonds uh, do have a place in portfolio. You just have to know uh, when to use them. Um, so uh, I got another poll here question for you uh, in terms of bond villains, uh, if you will. What are the biggest risk in bonds? So let me put that uh, question up there and uh, get the response from the audience here. Um, what is the biggest risk? Is it interest rate movements? Is it the credit uh, quality? Is it time to maturity or all of the above? Okay, let's close that off. I got two thirds of the vote in already. 82% uh, of you, all of the above. Um, yes, so all the factors are very, very important. So when you're thinking about fixed income and how that fits into your portfolios, you need to consider time to maturity, interest rate risk and credit, uh, credit risk. Very, very important. I'm gonna talk a little bit about currencies um, and how to fit that into your portfolio as well. Um, I have a note here in red that cryptos in, in my world are not currencies and are extremely risky. Having said that, if you want to speculate, go for it. Uh, they are an asset class. I'm not sure what they're going to morph into, but when I do the analysis of value, uh, I believe Bitcoin's worth closer to zero than where it trades today, and that applies for any cryptocurrency. Having said that, I do believe that Sometime in our, our not too distant future, whether that's 
10 or 20 years is hard to say, but the world will be paperless and coinless in terms of currency. Um, and we're going to have electronic money and the central banks of the world are going to control that. There might be something like a Bitcoin that's a centralized uh, transaction mechanism. It's not going to be an independent source. It is going to be controlled by governments. Um, Bitcoin may turn out to be a payment system of some sort. Uh, there may be some value to it, but there's no way that it's going to be worth 1.7 trillion or whatever some of these numbers, some of these people are are throwing around. It's it's very speculative to me. It it looks like tulips. Um, anybody can start a crypto and create one of these things, um, you know, and make their money. So that's a, it's a capitalist way. Just be very very careful if you're going to trade them. Um, I think they're going to be the the, the uh, standard deviation ride is going to be. Uh, probably one of the craziest rides you've ever been on. The emotional swings you'll get are, are going to be quite dramatic. Where I wanted to focus on in, in terms of currencies is when to hedge your portfolio and, and when not to uh, hedge your portfolio. Um, okay, so when when to hedge your portfolio and when not to hedge your portfolio. So what I did here is I went back to uh, Bretton Woods uh, and that in 1991, the world came off the gold standard um, and we had much more free floating currencies. Um, so I went back and I calculated what's the Canada US dollar rate, uh, what's the Canada euro rate, Canada yen rate, Canada British pound rate. Now the euro didn't exist before 1999. So in, in that we used the synthetic euro or which basically was the dollar Deutschmark. So we've got this data going back now uh, 47 years, and uh, the so the absolute average change Canada US dollar 5.39 percent. So take off the sign plus or minus direction, uh, and the median of 4 percent. Uh, so 4 to 5.4 percent a year currency is either going to help you or hurt you. And when in investing internationally the currency is a much, much bigger piece, as you could see, more than double Canada, US in terms of exchange rates. If you don't think when investing globally, currency is the most important consideration that you need to think about, you're naive and don't understand exactly what markets are uh, when you're investing globally. So currency is the most important uh, type of risk when you're investing globally has very little to do with the security you pick, the country you pick, or the sector you pick. It's your currency exposure that's going to really uh, be the main uh, differentiating factor. Uh, so again, with the, with the uh, Japan, if uh, Japan's economy is an export economy, the only way their market has grown in the last number of years is when the yen is falling. If you don't buy Japan with a currency hedge, you can easily wipe out a 10% return in a bad year by the currency drag. So it's very important, again, when investing globally, you understand the, the currency imp implications, uh, hugely important. The graphic there on the bottom just shows the difference between the, uh, the euro rate and the two different ways to play um, the Vanguard FTSE Europe ETF um, over the last couple of years. And you can see there, uh, currency is the spread between that yellow and, and white line there. Uh, it's very, very important factor in terms of your bottom line return. Again, most important, most important factor to uh, think about. So now I want to get into a little bit on the portfolio construction side of things. Uh, Vanguard's launched three portfolios, um, VCNS, VBAL, and VGRO. I get a lot of questions on Berman's call about these uh, three. Um, so these are almost like robo advising replacements uh, you got to figure out if you're doing it yourself uh, which class you fit into are you a growth are you a balance are you conservative and for 22 basis points they're going to build a, a globally diversified portfolio of bonds and fixed income um, and rebalance them for you so um, those of you who are even using robo advisors may even want to think about this as a even cheaper cost solution uh, than, than using robo-advisors. Um, uh, if that's all you're looking for is someone to build a portfolio uh, for you, it's, it's extremely uh, um, low cost. 
this is one of my favorite charts and really drills home, you know, why ETFs, Larry? Why do you always talk about ETFs? Why do you focus your show on ETFs? Um, is because when you look at the facts, and the, this is compiled by S&P Dow Jones, looking at the last 15 years, um, most portfolio managers are outperformed by their benchmark. And it doesn't matter what type of fund you are, um, large cap core funds, S&P 500, 97.5% of portfolio managers running large cap core funds don't beat the index. <laughs> If there's never been a more compelling reason to buy the low cost ETF as opposed to paying a full service fee, uh, I don't, I can't see any better argument than that. So doesn't doesn't matter what sector, large, mid, or small cap you're looking at, the vast majority of portfolio managers, 99.43% small cap growth managers don't beat the index. I mean, it, the, the numbers are really insane there. So when next time on you hear someone come on TV talking about I'm a stock picker and I know which stocks to buy, think about this table and think about what that really means because the, the facts are, are that simple. The research going back, whether it's 15 years, 10 years, 25 years, or 30 years, um, are overwhelming in this regard. So I want to look at the basis of building one of these portfolios. So in the Vanguard growth portfolio, for 22 basis points, you get uh, VCN, which is 24% Canada, VUN, 30.1% uh, broad U.S. market, VIU, international developed markets, 20%, VEE, or emerging markets, VAB is the entire Canadian bond market, VBU, 3.6%, uh, um, is the U.S. bond market, and VBG is the global uh, bond market. And um, I, what I did here in the graphic was I recreated this portfolio one where the ETFs didn't exist. I went and used proxies for those ETFs going back to pre-crisis 2007. And uh, what I want to focus on here is that I think a lot of these are great potential solutions for people, but they haven't rated them properly. This one's rated low to medium risk and an 80% equity, 20% bond portfolio rebalanced uh, annually. Um, going back to uh, 2007, this portfolio uh, in, at the worst in 2008 and 2009 was down in around 30 to 33% um, at the extremes. And so, you know, simple question, that's the cost of the ride. Can you handle the ride? So if you're going to buy VGRO and be, take a passive approach to the market and a buy and hold low risk, uh, you've got to be able to handle in the next recession uh, a drawdown that's probably going to be in and around that magnitude. And, you know, can you handle that? Of course, the ride up from 2012 and on was wonderful. And who doesn't want that kind of return? Uh, so these portfolios are going to track the markets. They're going to give you uh, you know, really good experience in terms of total return at a very, very low cost. But again, can you handle the ride? Because if that next dip, that next recession shakes you out and you end up selling um, down 15%, the, where, which is where the average investor tends to liquidate their portfolio because they can't handle the pain, the average correction going back to that chart, you know, maybe half an hour ago where I showed you all the drawdowns, the Papa Bears average 34, but the average correction that's 5% or more is 13.4%. So think about that. The average correction is 13.4% and the average investor tends to net be in net liquidity of their equity exposure once equities are down 15%. It tells you collectively we're all stupid. It doesn't really tell you we're stupid. It tells you we're emotionally driven. It tells you we're selling when we really should be buying. And that's one of the challenges. So I don't think this is a low to medium risk portfolio. I think actually this is, is, is on the higher end of medium to high, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but they have all three portfolios ranked low to medium risk. And, and I think that's a little bit uh, questionable. So something you have to think about. Uh, oh, so I should add also, let me go back to this page. 
Uh, I think the uh, too much Canada exposure. Canada's 3% of the world. And if you're going to get a truly global portfolio, unless you really believe energy is coming back in a big, big way, or, or you want the benefit of the dividend tax credit, having much more than 3% in Canada is a big bet on commodities. And I'm not sure that's going to be the, the next 10 or 20 years in front of us here. Um, I think we're more likely to be go further into a service type economy where technology, as we age healthcare, which Canada has very little of in our indexes, uh, is going to give you a good ride. You, you need more international, you need more U.S., you need more uh, European, and you certainly need more emerging market exposure where most of the growth in the world is going to come from you know, over the next 10 to 20 years. So a couple of possible uh, outcomes. Here uh, we got the Fed tightening cycle, the unwinding of the balance sheet. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the current economic surprise index because it's turned down dramatically. Um, and then I'm going to look at uh, a couple of the other things. Uh, starting off with the uh, trade war on things that uh, could be unexpected here. You know, Trump pulled pulled out of the uh, Iran deal yesterday. Initially, markets were a bit anxious about it. Um, and today, the markets... Uh, you know, pushing up to uh, towards recent highs again. Uh, I've said for a while here the the underlying earnings are good and we should be buying dips. And I was really aggressively buying in my sleep at night portfolios over the last couple of months. I'm not buying right here. I don't think we have too much more upside, maybe four or five percent, uh, before I get very defensive again. Um, and I do think you know recession in 2019, 2020 is is very likely. So I don't think we want to be too bullish. But I also believe the trade wars are just beginning. I, I doubt very much Trump's going to be able to negotiate a whole lot with with China and even with NAFTA. I think what you're likely to see, best case scenario, um, is an agreement to agree at something to agree upon in the future. Uh, and Trump will say, hey, we got it. We, we got the agreement for a better agreement in the future and, and say that's all good, believe me. Um, but I, I think these trade wars are just beginning and ultimately are, are going to be a bit of a headwind for a number of years to come. But we'll, we'll see. That's just one man's opinion. Uh, but this graphic here shows China's dominance in the steel industry being half the world uh, you know, as of 2016 and, and why Trump is really focused on that and China in particular uh, as his basis for uh, uh, the global trade war he's igniting. Um, I'm really concerned about the size of the central bank balance sheets as a percentage of, of world GDP. Um, and and it's, it's really, um, it's got up to levels that are, are catastrophic in my mind. And so now we're talking about the central banks normalizing or unwinding their balance sheets. So ultimately, that's going to push a lot of supply into the market. At the same time, the U.S. government is, is running trillion-dollar deficits again, as far as the eye can see. Uh, so bond yields are, are going to be rising. Um, and so that's a uh, troubling thing for equity markets. That was the one of the catalysts for equity markets coming a bit unglued in, in uh, late January and early February of bond yields rising. We got a lot more of that to come. Um, having said that, I think uh, long bonds are, are, as we saw, are going to be one of your best protections in a recession, um, you know, coming up um, in 2019 or 2020. I think that's really uh, uh, important to, uh, to think about. But I think this is going to be uh, an issue. You've heard of the uh, phrase global synchronous growth. And uh, in 20, late 2016 and 2017, all the purchasing managers indexes were well above uh, 50 and in expansion mode. And you can see in the last quarter um, that we've had the U.S. turned down. We've had uh, Eurozone turned down. Uh, we've had Japan turned down. Uh, China turned up a little bit, but was turning down as of uh, the first two months of the year. And the Canadian number is ridiculous. There's, they, they, it's a terrible index. They should be, be redoing that one. Uh, the volatility of it is insane. They should really need to smooth that out. It's not a great economic benchmark at all. Uh, but we're only 3% of the world, so we don't count in the big picture. Um, industrial production is another thing where we had this global synchronous growth in 2017, where all these indexes were in expansion mode above zero. Um, as you can see again in the last couple of months, we've seen China, we've seen Japan, we've seen Canada, um, and uh, Eurozone sort of take a turn down, and the U.S. actually last month too, 
in terms of industrial production have started to turn down a little bit. Um, when we look at um, expectations of what's happening and uh, what actually comes out in terms of the economic numbers, Europe's fallen off a cliff. One of the reasons the, the euro can't strengthen too much here is, is because the European economy can't handle the strong euro. So a lot of people say, oh, the dollar is going, Trump wants a weak dollar, Trump wants a weak dollar. The money has to go somewhere. If they're selling dollars, it's got to go somewhere. And if there's, if there's reserve currency of the world, folks, is, is going down, the money needs to go into uh, another big pool of money. And so Canada's too small for that. And the Chinese currency isn't free floating yet. So you have two choices. You have European, Europe, or you have Japan or, or British pound. Those are the economies big enough to handle the dollar cash flow. And so you, British uh, uh, has seen the British pound uh, rally back up. And so is Euro. And what we've seen there is economic data has turned into uh, to be very, very weak. So the economic surprise indexes are turning over. They're rolling over in the U.S. as well. So I, I see the rising interest rates uh, and the economy is actually getting weaker. And I think that is going to limit the uh, equity market exposure, uh, equity market potential on the upside, given that uh, valuations are, are relatively high. Um, the best forecaster of a recession is the yield curve. I've had this on Berman's call a couple of times. Um, and so looking at the yield curve there, going back into the 80s, the yield curve inverts before every recession. It's a very, very uh, reliable indicator. Um, and so we need to see that yield curve uh, invert uh, for us to start calling a recession. In a recession, on average, earnings fall 20%. The multiple of the market falls to something below average and equities tend to fall. So based on the current multiple, um, around 17 times forward earnings, historically that's around 14 times. Uh, in a recession, that's going to be at around 12 times forward earnings. Um, so very quickly, $155 in earnings for the S&P 500 this year, maybe a little bit more than that. If, we, if this yield curve inverts, as I expect it will, in the first half of 2019, then a recession within the next year is very likely. And that's why I'm saying back half of 2019, 2020 is when that recession starts playing out. Equity markets on average tend to peak uh, well before the recession. Um, the New York Fed probability index and what the yield curve is telling us now about a recession, you can go on the New York Fed website, Google search New York Fed recession probability index, um, and this tells us what's the likelihood of a recession in the next 12 months as predicted by the slope of the U.S. yield curve. This number needs to get to about 25% before that curve inverts. And so we're not anywhere close to that yet, but the yield curve continues to flatten on trend. This graphic that I put together here looks at uh, past recessions, uh, the last five of them. And I didn't count the double dip recession in the 1980s. I took that as one whole recession. Um, and then I, I went back and I did the average um, of what equity markets did at ground zero over the recession and two years before and the one year after. As you can see on the graphic here, by the time the recession is actually officially labeled, the um, uh, NBER, which is the Nas National Bureau of Economic Research that labels these things, they typically need at least seven months of economic data, more often more than that, uh, to label the recession. So seven months after the recession, eight, nine months after the recession, all the damage has been done. Equity markets have already bottomed basically by the time they say, hey, there's a recession. There's very little downside to go. Uh, that peak to trough correction there is in and around 30%. So again, average recession equities fall about 30%. That's why I'm saying 30 to 50 in the next one, depending on the severity of it. And equity markets tend to peak around eight to nine months before the recession. So when that Fed probability index says very high probability of recession as that yield curve inverts sometime in the first half of next year. That's probably when we see the next market peak. The other reasons that cause the big uh, type of corrections are financial systemic risk, glo geopolitics, global wars, but most often a run on the banks or something in, in financial area. There's plenty of liquidity today, and I don't think that risk is going to be upon us. 
when we look at uh, past recessions um, and we look at what the Canadian dollar does, you can see here uh, during the pink periods on average that Canadian dollar, when that black line is rising, is selling off um, or flat at best. So typically during a recession, Canadian dollar weakens. Why? Oil prices are typically falling, less demand for, for stuff. Canada does worse in a recession. So being in the U.S. dollar is actually very good uh, as a flight to safety as a Canadian investor. So if you're going to go to cash, you might think about going to U.S. cash, um, although it depends where we are. So how much risk should you take in your portfolios? So I don't really care which type of investor you are, whether you're a super aggressive accumulator or you're a, a follower or a very passive conservative investor. Um, I think you should build your portfolios to try to generate the highest possible return with the least amount of risk. That's what I do in my sleep at night portfolios. The higher return with less risk allows you to withstand the volatility that you're all going to take as we go into uh, to equity markets ups and downs. So three economic scenarios and some portfolios to suit, and then we'll, we'll answer some questions in the last 10 minutes here. Um, stagflation and that's an economic environment where you have slow or very sluggish growth still positive growth not a recession um, and rising inflation and monetary and fiscal policy which are the main policy tools of governments to help us out of slow growth periods are ineffectual in a period of uh, slow growth with rising inflation because spending more money is going to boost inflation cutting interest rates is going to boost inflation and with rising inflation pressures uh, that's not a good thing to do so monetary policy tools to take us out of stagflation are very very difficult and if we get into that environment here's an, an idea uh, in terms of portfolios I'm going to pass on that survey question there just because we're running short on time um, here's a couple of ideas here in terms of portfolios. So in a rising rate environment, floating rate notes are important. So as central banks are tightening things up a little bit, floating rate notes are going to give you uh, a pretty decent return uh, in your portfolio. Laddered preferreds here in Canada. So you generally want about 60% um, in terms of bond-like uh, exposure in your portfolio compared to 40% equity-like and you want to focus on high quality, high dividend, and covered call strategies. Um, so here's my favorite combination of the BMO put right in the U.S. and the high dividend. Remember, U.S. is about 50% of the world. If you're going to make a big bet on Canada, do it because of dividends and nothing else, um, because Canada is 3% of the world, and you're going to miss out on a lot of the technology and growth that you're going to see in, in uh, from European healthcare for example, or some of the great technology companies uh, in the U.S. Uh, so that would be a portfolio to suit most people, uh, high dividend and defensive bond holdings, uh, looking at uh, if we go into a stagflation type environment. If we go into a recession type environment where you know economic growth is, is receding, uh, therefore central banks are uh, starting to cut interest rates and interest rates starting to fall. Remember, in a recession, earnings fall about 20%. Equity multiples fall, so equities get hurt pretty bad in, in a recession um, amongst the worst of all the correction types of corrections. Uh, sometime in the next 100 plus basis points of Fed rate hikes, uh, I believe, will that will trip the inversion of the yield curve and will start to... Uh, to factor in a recession at that point and price one into markets. So that's the time you want to be most offensive. And so, again, skipping over that poll, um, I want to uh, look at a conservative type portfolio and I want to look at an aggressive type portfolio uh, for the accumulator types. Uh, so again, uh, long-term bonds is going to give you a price return potential as interest rates go down. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, preferred stocks in the U.S. that tend to be more perpetual, trade bond-like, and so as interest rates are going down, preferreds tend to perform uh, positive. That's not true in Canada with the reset preferred markets. And then you want to focus on either low volatility ETFs, the put right strategy to generate yield, or high quality uh, companies on an international basis. So you want the all-country, 
high quality index. Again, I mentioned a basket of the best quality, best balance sheets, at least leverage. So they'll stand the test of time. Doesn't mean they won't fall in a recession, but they'll be the best companies to own, uh, Warren Buffett-like companies to own in a recession, um, whether that's, again, global or, or just focusing on the U.S. And again, a lot of U.S. dollar exposure in this portfolio, uh, given that the Canadian dollar is likely to fall. So that should buffer portfolios as well. For the um, accumulator types who, who are into, you know, they love their FANG stocks and they love their momentum plays and things like that. Um, by all means, buy your gold, buy your, your, your niche sectors, your biotechs, whatever it is that you like. Just a couple of long-term recommendations here that sectors that, that I think are, are very, very interesting um, to, to play long-term. Short term, very overbought. I wouldn't necessarily jump into any of them at the moment. Um, but I would suggest, again, a lot of long term uh, bond exposure, a lot of US dollar exposure, and to hedge some of those long bets on the equity market side, uh, an inverse position in small cap stocks in the US. Typically in a recession, small cap stocks lead to the downside because they're not globally diversified and, and have that risk. So RWM is a single short position on the Russell 2000 RSP eligible to hedge off some of your long exposure. Think it like a hedge fund. Be market neutral on equities. Uh, you could be net short if you wanted to be. Have a little bit of gold for diversification and uh, use the long bond because that's going to be one of our best friends in a recession scenario. And finally, uh, Trump is the best president of all times. We have an economic melt up for the next year and a half. Market ignores the overvaluation, all the, the debt impact and the rising interest rates. Maybe that's a scenario, but I, I, I think probably not. Um, and as you look at a portfolio that will do best in a melt up environment, again, it's your uh, niche sectors, uh, I love Israeli technology. I think that's going to be great. If we melt up robotics and artificial intelligence is going to be a big player in that. And so will the, the FANG stocks will, will still tend to lead. Emerging market, internet and e-commerce. Um, saw a video today on something in, out of China called WeChat. Looks incredible as a platform. Um, so all these things... Uh, are, are very, very exciting long-term investments. Again, short-term, very overvalued and overbought. Uh, so in a recession, you know, we'll get hit. And so you don't want to play this portfolio if recession is the outcome. But if you believe melt-up is, is what you do, play the, play the momentum EDFs, um, a basket of Canadian momentum stocks. So these are the, the stocks with the best price momentum and the best earnings momentum. So really filtering the, the broader indexes for the for the growth type stocks and so play global play uh, US um, and 100% equities no reason why you can't if you're uh, willing to take the risk and, and play to the upside so with that in mind now um, just a closing uh, screen here again if, if you've seen anything you like you're going to get an email after the presentation and we're asking for your feedback on the quality of the webinar uh, content of the webinar um, there'll be blocks there. If you want to copy of the presentation, just check the box and you'll get a, you'll get a copy of the presentation. We, we often get asked for those. Uh, there'll be a couple uh, links for donations. Uh, again, one of the things that we like to do here um, at my firm and I've been doing for many, many years now is charitable fundraising. Two great charities we support, uh, cancer research at the Sick Kids Hospital here in Toronto and brain health, uh, uh, dementia, and Alzheimer's research at the Baycrest uh, uh, Hospital in, in Toronto here. Uh, one of the world leaders in brain uh, and cognition research. Uh, so a big, big thing that I support as well. Um, and so I'll look at some of the questions. I've got a lot of, of slides that have come in here now. Um, okay, so I'll go through them very quickly. If you were retired and had a million dollars Looking to buy a dividend-paying ETF, which one would you purchase? I wouldn't buy one. I, I, I well, so think about my global tactical dividend fund. Um, you know, at the D-class level, it's it's a little over 100 basis points. Um, but if you wanted to go buy all the individual ETFs 
and you know manage them yourself. I, I love the high dividend covered call strategy, BMO Suite right now. I own a lot of those. You can go look online and see it, some of the things I own in, in the dividend fund. But one of the things that I'm going to do in the dividend fund that, that you're probably not going to do is when the markets swing up and down and swing up and down, I'm going to take advantage of, of those movements to, to deliver extra returns uh, for investors. But uh, go look at the BMO suite. I think they're amongst the best in the world in terms of searching for the best quality of dividend payers. And BMO is the world leader in, in option strategies. I'm not specifically trying to pump BMO. You can go check out the Vanguard or, or the iShares, uh, you know, global dividend stocks. iShares has a CYH, which is uh, for 66 basis points. It's a global dividend seeking currency hedged uh, ETF. So that's a rather interesting st st uh, strategy. It's, it's not active. It's a passive index, uh, but it's most similar to the global dividend strategy uh, that I'm running in, in the sleep at night uh, fund. Um, is this being recorded um, for later access? Yes, it is. Um, uh, let's see. I'm, um, on my income for T3, ETF sometimes shows a return on capital. Does return component reduce the amount invested? If so, is this a true return? So there's two kinds of returns on capital. There's a bad kind and a good kind. The bad kind of return on capital uh, is, is the type where the underlying distributions of all the holdings of stocks, you know, might be three or four percent, and they're paying you six percent in the ETF. So you're getting some of your own money back, and that's a return of ca a return on capital. Uh, and so that's not a good type of return on capital. Uh, sometimes as an ETF grows in size, um, for example, let's say you had an ETF that was $100 million one month, and then the next quarter that it's due to pay another dividend is $200 million. And let's say a lot of that money came in very late in the quarter. So you don't want to penalize the original unit holders, and so you want to be able to pay a dividend equal to everybody in the unit holder, except a lot of those dividends had been earned in the month or two before that new money came in. So they will equalize the dividend for everybody as if everyone was in it from the beginning. Uh, so the distribution doesn't change. And so that is a return of capital. That's a good kind of return on capital because it equalizes the, uh, the distribution. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, market timing so important. How does one ignore persistent warning of recessions expected within months? Um, uh, Jerry, that's a very good question. And so what I've learned over the years, um, me, not me, not anyone else, nobody knows exactly what the economic playbook is going to look like in terms of recession or not. So I would soon, just as soon turn the TV off, not listening to uh, me or any of the doom and gloom sayers or whatever else that you're worried about and putting your head in the sand and build a portfolio that's prudent that gets the yield that you need, that you can handle the ride, and that is the smartest thing to do, where you can be a little bit active by moving your asset mix from 60-40 to 40-60. Again, very simple. If you're worried about the world falling apart, um, sell the VBAL and go to the VCNS. And if the world keeps going, at least you're getting a yield and, and you're in there still. If the world does turn into recession, you're, you're not gonna be hurt as much in the more conservative portfolio. Once the markets are down 15% uh, or more and things are starting to look better, flip back to the VBAL so when the markets recover, you do a little bit better. If you can't handle the ride, you shouldn't be investing. Uh, that's the best message I have. Uh, do smart beta ETFs generally outperform the plain index? Uh, Kevin showed a slide in his portfolio of the different types of uh, uh, places in the world, emerging markets, this, that, and the other uh, asset class uh, that some outperform, some underperform. The reality is sometimes momentum wins, sometimes value wins, sometimes growth wins. There's no pattern to it. What I like to do is I like to use all these different smarter type strategies. When I want to be more defensive, I have some more low vol, I have a bit more high quality, I have high dividends, I have covered calls so that when markets fall, I go down a bit less. And then when markets are at a level where I think they're good value, I want more high beta. I want my beta to be closer to one, meaning uh, everything the market goes up, I want to capture that. So I control the beta in my portfolio by being more defensive when I risk off with a higher yield. 
And when I want to be risk on, I have a lower yield but higher upside potential because I'm more core exposed to the uh, the equity markets in general. So I don't need to know which ones are going to outperform. I like to buy momentum when the momentum factor is cheap. So if momentum has been underperforming for some period of time and there's a reason uh, for momentum to start under, outperforming, I'll add some. Same thing for value, same thing for growth. Um, I would look at all the different factors and when those factors are cheap relative to something else that's expensive, I will sell expensive and I will buy cheap and that's my value kind of hat on. Um, a momentum investor is typically going to buy what's expensive and hope to sell it even more expensive and just wants to stay things with the things with very strong positive momentum. Completely different style than I advocate for. Uh, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just a different mentality and you need a different mindset in terms of your ability to accept risk when you're playing in the growth space. You, you just need to be acceptive of, of more risk. Um, I've got a, one more minute left. I'm not going to be able to uh, to get to everything here. Um, final question here. Um, let's see. Um, question here. Will high yield bonds lead stocks lower? Um, so very often uh, credit is a leading indicator. Uh, so as credit spreads widen, uh, that would be a leading indicator. So if you see HYG, or BMO ZHY or JNK or any of these types of ETFs um, start to fall and the broader equity markets aren't falling. Typically they fall in tandem. Um, but credit does, credit widening does tend to uh, lead at market peaks. Um, but it's not going to be as clear as saying, hey, HYG is falling. I should sell my equities. Uh, it's not that easy. It's, it's, it's more of a coincident indicator. I would put it as a leading indicator. Best leading indicator for thinking about a recession is the inversion of the yield curve. I showed you that chart there. You can go back to post-World War II and look at all of them. And you've always had a recession uh, following an inversion of the yield curve. Uh, and if you didn't have a recession, you had a very significant economic lull. Um, and in every case, equity markets tend to pull back. Sometimes it's only... 10 or 15 percent if it's only a mid-cycle correction. But as of November, this will be the longest economic expansion in post-World War II without a recession. So you can bet when the next recession hits, it's probably going to be a doozy, especially given that there's double the debt in the world and we've already played with the zero interest rate boundary. Um, anyways, thanks very much, folks. Again, you'll get the email uh, shortly after the call here. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for staying with us, and uh, it'll be available on replay. Have a great day and good uh, investing.